You can start, Lynn. Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to an introduction to our kitchen table climate conversations. This is the program of Climate Fast, and I'd like to just give a few comments about how this program came about. We started developing this program about two years ago following the June 2018 provincial election. We had been focusing our work on supporting the climate plan, Transform TO, in Toronto. However, the election of an anti-climate action provincial government caused us to look at why. It seems there are a lot of people in Ontario who don't understand that we are in a climate emergency and that we need urgent action. It is vital that climate action be happening throughout the province and that the provincial government become involved as it was in the past in supporting the transition to a renewable energy future. So we designed this program to train facilitators and hosts across the province to offer small group opportunities for reaching out to family, friends, neighbors, work colleagues, and others in our communities around the province. It's not enough for small committed groups of environmentalists to call for climate action. That needs to come from a wide group of citizens in ridings all over the province. This is a challenging topic to address and therefore we wanted to develop materials to make that easier. Um, these are available on our website, our Kitchen Table Conversations page. And we also provided two in-person full day training opportunities, June 2019 and February 2020. Shortly after our second training, COVID hit. We then regrouped to redesign our materials for use in online Zoom style discussions. That's what we'll be sharing with you tonight. We see the kitchen table climate conversation program as a point of entry for concerned citizens to understand the nature of the emergency we are in, in some very simple graphs. We wanna make that part of it really pretty short and what we can do about it. Our focus is on engaging people to be able to talk about their questions, their concerns, uh, to be able to develop their interest and hopefully to follow up on the kitchen table experiences with various actions. We'll talk about that later in the evening. It's also great just to make sure people know more, even if they can't get involved in a group or specific actions, they'll be better informed to continue sharing in their own informal ways, in their own communities. We just wanna get uh, this information out uh, in a widespread way because many people do not understand um, what's involved. Media coverage is fairly limited. We're not getting enough of it. So this is one way to get around, around that. So just to let you know, this is one of Climate Fast program. We are also involved in action at municipal, provincial and federal level on other concerns, on specific concerns. We comment on planning and legislation and we have made a commitment to anti-racism action as well. We work with other climate groups for particular moments for example, the push for a green and just recovery at the federal level, which is critically important right now. And for example, working with Fridays for Future. So the Climate Week initiatives that are coming up from September 20th to 26th. We also have a working group on retrofits and another one on webcasts. You can find out more at www.climatefast.ca, sign up for our newsletter and find out how to get involved. So I'm going to hand things over right now to Colleen, who is one of the volunteers who's put the most time and energy into developing this program. And uh, I'll pass it over to her for uh, starting the evening. Thank you and welcome again, everyone. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. So um, tonight um, I'm going to actually, it's gonna be a conversation, but also a sort of a demonstration of our toolkit and our, um, the, some of the tools that we have provided on the website for you to run a guided conversation about the climate. Um, so I will be going back and forth between that and a facilitating conversation. So uh, we have Mark, if Mark can actually, um, Ray, if you could stop spotlight on Lynn and we could see Mark, that would be great. Um, and Mark is gonna actually monitor chat for us. So if you want to speak, you can put an S in the chat or even just write your question or comment in if you'd like, and we will um, pause and address um, the question. Um, so I think, 
so there. So um, actually, Lynn also is the co-host. So if my internet goes out for any reason, which it does sometimes, she, she can step in for, for a moment. All right, so when we have our kitchen table, first you start with introductions. And so the next exercise called Why We Bother? And that's really kind of asking what motivates you to come to this conversation? What motivates you to be concerned and to take action? Um, and so by way of introductions, we are in a very extraordinary time, of course. Um, we have COVID-19, which has turned our, our lives upside down. And it's definitely connected to the climate crisis because it's connected to the biodiversity crisis. Um, and it's also shown that it's also shaken up. It, people have lost loved ones and jobs and security, and it's shown how threats are compounded in a crisis. Um, it's shown, especially for those that are marginalized and racialized in our current unjust system, it's shown a housing crisis, a lack of migrant rights. We see inequity and injustice and ongoing police brutality. Um, we see it in the pipelines going on indigenous territory. Um, and so we also see a tremendous, we also see a tremendous outpouring of care and concern in communities and of networks of support. We see more people questioning the inherent racism in society. Um, and we're revaluing things. We're looking at our communities anew. So in this context, I would like us maybe for the introductory exercise to think about something in a sentence or two that motivates us to take action for change. So if you could just give your name and a sentence or two about what you care about, basically why you're here, that would be great. And um, I'm gonna ask Rosemary to start. Okay, put me on the spot. So I'm Rosemary, I'm a volunteer at Climate Fest. Um, why am I here? Um, well, I, I, I've always been someone who fought for social justice and I see climate justice for many years as connected with social justice. So the most uh, vulnerable and those that have least contributed to the problem are the ones most affected by it. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Rosemary. Mark? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Colleen. Uh, for hosting tonight's event. Um, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm here. I'm also a volunteer for Climate Fast. I had wanted to attend a few previous kitchen table climate conversations, but was unable to. I think spreading the word, uh, talking about it, making uncomfortable conversations, for just justice issues across the board, um, and specifically here tonight, uh, the climate uh, is, is extremely important in, in broadening the education and the awareness in people. Uh, and I'm looking forward to um, having more of these conversations tonight and taking it forward with me. Thank you, Mark. That was really well said. <laughs> Lynn? Yes, well, I've gotten involved in climate work because I care about the world that my children are going to live in and my grandchildren and all other young people on the planet, as well as all the animals and plants on the planet who are very much affected by the changing climate. Uh, and it's a, sol it's, it's a solvable crisis, something we can do something about. So I see it as intergenerational justice and uh, really glad to be part of that action for that reason. Yeah, Valerie? Hi, um, I was a kindergarten teacher for many, many years and spent a lot of time with a small group of children uh, encouraging them to love the natural world. And I retired recently and wanted to devote my time to um, making sure that there's a natural world uh, for them. And um, also, I, uh, especially during these COVID times, have recognized how interconnected uh, the climate work is with social justice work. And so I've really learned a lot um, in the process and I'm also learning still. Uh, and just for the record, I'm the volunteer coordinator. So if you're watching this webcast, uh, you'll be hearing from me if you sign up. Thanks. Thank you, Valerie. Natsuki, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name properly. <laughs> Welcome. 
Hi, um, my name is Natsuki. I'm working as a volunteer for uh, Africa Climate Action Initiative. And also I'm personally uh, passionate about climate change and, and our social actions. Also business, uh, uh, business as usual and life as usual is something we should change after COVID-19 is over as well as now. Yeah, yeah, nice to meet you everybody. Yeah, thank you. Tanya? Hi, um, my name is Tanya. And uh, um, yeah, I am generally, I want to help there be life, flourishing life in the future and a more fair world for people as well. And uh, I'm, I've been recently possibly doing some work with For Our Kids and I've worked with people in Climate Fast in the past and the Fridays for Future Strikes and so I'm seeking to also gain more knowledge and help my, uh, expand my ability to talk about the climate crisis. Thanks. Great. Wendy? Um, I just think humans are just part of the, the whole. We're just a small piece. And I don't see what gives us the right to take the world as we know it down, um, you know, from the microscopic uh, life form to the biggest life form. And honestly, and we're taking ourselves down with it, um, which is really kind of interesting. Um, it boggles the mind that people are so short sighted. Uh, and as a mom, too, you know, I would like for my daughter to have. A better world and this polarization of the rich versus the poor and it's all about the stuff well stuff in the long run really doesn't make you happy you're happy for five minutes and then you want more stuff but if you're walking through the forest or if you're patting your cat or you're um, trying to regenerate something so that it becomes it, it goes back to a more natural environmental state. I think that's where the joy and the happiness lies and the relationships with, with everything, whether it's the tree or the coyote or your kids or your friends. Um, it's particularly important. Mm -hmm. So that's me. That's lovely, Wendy. Um, Yuan Chen Chen. Hi, my name is Yuan Chen. Um, I live in Toronto now. Uh, 2015, December, our whole family went to Singapore. We saw um, that exhibition about global warming that opened my eyes. And when I came back to Toronto, I, I joined a um, climate fast and learn more about what is it going on. So, and then I find out my behavior and my lifestyle contribute to the global warming. And so I start to have my, I sold my car and uh, I learn what more I should change. And I, it's great that in Climate Fast, I learned it's, it's important to have social action. It's not only myself. So, however, my Chinese, my, my, I, I speak Cantonese and I'm a Christian. I find there are thousands and thousands of people in the church every Sunday. Um, it's, it's not talking about this. And so last year I attended kitchen table conversation the whole day. After that, I started to teach Sunday school in different church. And I go to different church fellowship to talk about the climate problem. And I did that in Cantonese and I wish we can do more. So tonight I, I come back and uh, to learn more about more update. And I will, I will encourage more people to come on September. 
So we have more Cantonese speaking people hopefully understand the English. I, I don't follow everything each time, but I, I am trying. So my goal is to, to share this message. The, it, it, is, it is global injustice. Mm -hmm. So this message to, to the people who speak the same first language with me. So this is my, my goal and I Thank come you. tonight. Great. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my name is Sarah Kamau. I'm a coordinator with Africa Climate Action Initiative. And um, the reason why I am so passionate about this is um, I would want to have my children one day and I tell them these are elephants and they are here. You know, instead of telling, going, um, telling them that, you know, there used to be animals that were called elephants that were this, they look like this because they disappeared or they became extinct uh, because we failed to do that. Or come and tell them, oh, th th here there used to be a river, you know, that used to pass through here and it no longer flows through here. So that is why I'm so passionate about um climate change and uh, also coming from a family that is also farmers. We've seen the devastation of what uh, climate change does to farming. And therefore, um, that is the reason why I also joined um, Climate First because of their resilience and um, yeah, and their drive to push for this agenda. And it's not just for all of us, but it's for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Jay, I don't know if you can speak or have to put into chat. So maybe Mark, if she has to put her introduction in chat, you could read it up for us. So Jay is a member of Climate Fast. Um, so I will read out her response that she's just typed. I've been a member of Climate Fast for about two years and have been involved in social justice issues for many years. I'm now very concerned about the health and habitat of whale species, which is why I'll be fighting Doug Ford's proposed and destructive Highway 4 413. I have just joined the Anti-Racism Committee and look forward to how we'll bring forward better conditions for BIPOC people. Awesome, thank you, Jay, welcome. Um, so at this point, I want to ask Valerie to come forward and do our land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge the sacred land on which we live and meet today. This land has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. It is the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Putun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We acknowledge that we meet on stolen land and do so to show solidarity with indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. We recognize that decolonization must be an active and ongoing process of reconciliation. Thank you, Valerie. So at this point, I'm going to actually share some of the toolkit resources. So I'm going to start screen sharing. And um, if you do have something to say, please do enter into the chat and I will be checking in. And also Mark can interrupt me at, at any point. Um, so we have two resources and I'm just going to show you the first one. Um, and you'll find if you are doing your presentation and you might want to screen share and so having things set up on your screen before you start is um, is a good move and sort of testing and practicing. It can be a bit tricky. I'm going to ask, you should see the, the introduction, why do we bother exercise up there now? Um, this is what we have in our kit. And I sprung this on you, but we do suggest that you might send this to people before they meet for your conversation so they can think a bit. Now, this group, is it was wonderfully articulate. But some of the groups you meet with may not be, they may not be as experienced or they may not know as much. So sending this ahead of time could help them. Um, so 
if you're sharing two documents, you probably won't have to. I am doing that right now. You have to stop sharing and start sharing again to get to the second document. So Zoom is a bit tricky when you're trying to do a Zoom conversation, but I'll show you how that works. I'm going to screen share again and the other document. So you should be able to see the four, four facilitators now. And um, I wanted to touch on this first because in our toolkit, we have a guide for facilitators that's chock full of information. And you probably will not be showing this to your attendees, but you might wanna either print out some of it or have some things um, set up before your conversation. Um, so this is called, we call it the facilitator resource and it's a companion for the presenter slides, which you will probably be showing. And we divided agenda, we did create a suggested agenda, and we divided it among science and impacts, social science, areas for change, a better world, actions and solutions, and supporting one another. So these resources are actually for each of those sections. Um, and we find that the conversations, online conversations, can go on really, really long. So we've put a few sort of ideas for shortening the conversation in this document. Um, you can send resources in advance. You could suggest a second conversation, but more than anything, you can take a look at your group that you've invited, whether they're coworkers or whether they're your um, community members, and you can decide what level they're at as far as understanding um, the science, for example, or the working together, and just pick and choose. You might even just show a video and have a conversation, or you might show the slides that we have. Um, so picking and choosing and tailoring it to your audience is a really good idea. And I'll show you some of the options and, and how, how um, things we've suggested. Um, we also have a bit of a guide to using Zoom and people have different levels of experience with Zoom. So we do suggest five or 10 people for the conversation because it's easier to manage and, it, and more people get to participate if it's smaller. Um, and we think you'll, you'll probably need to set the call up for two hours. And we do say that if you don't have the capacity to do that, just let us know because we can help you set up the Zoom conversation. Um, and you might also want to um, do some of these things I've got here in the corner for managing the conversation. Some people like a really informal conversation. So then you might just go like this. Right, you know, and, and then you, and you can see everyone if you've got a small group usually and you can just um, answer people um, or you might want to try a, a mix of putting S's in the chat and waving just whatever the feeling you want for your conversation kind of dictates that a little bit. Um, so I'm not this is the suggested agenda. This is really detailed and you won't be showing this to the people, but this is for you. And we've gone through the introductions, <clears throat> but we went through the land acknowledgement as well. And we suggest that you personalize the land acknowledgement to where you're meeting and do a little bit of research and make it a little more meaningful for each conversation. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna go next and just, I'm just gonna show you one or two more in this document to give you an idea of how it works. And then we'll just switch the presenter document and we'll, we'll go through a conversation a little bit more. <clears throat> so, you'll see in this document is chock full of facts. And this is to give you support and so that you have information that you can use in your conversation if you want it or if you need it. And each of these slides corresponds with one of the presented, presenter slides. So I'm gonna show you how that works, but say you have a group of people who doesn't know much about the science at all, you might wanna start with explaining um, some of the basics and if you know, if you have, if your group knows a bit about the IPCC report, because it's very, very popular, you might want to just focus on the IPCC report and um, and talk about it, or show a video. So we have lots of options in these resources that you can pick and choose from, and you can always refer to the facilitator guide for um, talking points so that you feel more comfortable. And. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm talking too much already. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing this, <coughs> excuse me. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share as long as there are no questions or anything on there, Mark. <coughs> okay. I'm gonna screen share the presenter slides now and we're gonna walk through a bit of a conversation. It's a bit more participatory um, this way. And we're just gonna close the facilitator ones. 
So these are the presenter slides. And what we've done, as you'll see, is made them very clear and easy for people to see. And so they'd be very um, <clears throat> accessible if you want to use them. And we started with a real basic slide that shows when we started using fossil fuels, that's when global warming and the CO2 spiked. And so it's pretty clear that it's human caused. So that's a very basic science fact in a very um, actually um, compelling slide for the urge, you know, for the fact that it's um, something that we have caused. So it's something we can do something about. And this is the IPCC one. And I like this one because it shows that if we keep temperatures down even by half a degree incrementally, we make a huge difference to how many people are exposed to severe drought, to flooding, to food scarcity. And this shows, this kind of shows the importance of action as well, you know, and it can compel people to feel that it matters to work together and to make change. It's really interesting if you want to, though, just let a video speak for you. And I wanted to show you, this is, you might, if you're running your conversation, have this set up already, but I wanted to, to show you how the links work from the document. So I'm gonna actually click on this link and then I have to stop screen sharing and start again and show you the video. So here, I'll show um, you. Before, you. before you start the video, there is just a question okay. about your previous slide uh, okay. showing fossil fuel use. Oh, yeah. So Yun Chen Chen has said <laughs> fossil fuel started to be used in 2019 that late. And so I think maybe the years are. Oh, um, yeah, that's a bit confusing. But you know what that shows? That shows, the, see how many years are in each of these blocks? So there are so many years in this block that it, it was actually 200 years ago where this started to spike. But the 200 years are squished up in this graph because it is really, the timeline's really drawn out. So if we were not gonna cheat this much and show you a graph that showed 20, 1950, 1960, 1970, you would still see a spike, but you wouldn't see as dramatic a spike. So I think the reason for this diagram, which is one that's used by the, um, the center that monitors CO2 emissions, is just to show you that it's been a really, really short amount of time in the history of all of time when this is spiked, right? So it actually, this is 200 years ago to 2019, this, this line. So yeah, that's a very good question. And that actually is hard to see. Now, there are some other graphs you could use, as I said, that aren't as dramatic, but that do show the years a bit more clearly. And we can, we can actually provide those if you'd like. Thanks, Colleen. Yes, Lynn has said that maybe we needed a graph from 1950 to today. Yeah. Or um or a hundred year or 200 years from 1819 to yeah yeah that would show it too yeah okay great question so i'll try showing this video now hello and goodbye again <laughs> okay so when you're showing a video you can either have it set up ahead of time or you can just use the links like i just did and you can just press watch. You can choose to make it full screen if you want. The earth has already warmed one degree Celsius since the 19th century. Our goal was to cap warming at well below two degrees. Okay, I just wanted to show that, to show you how dramatic it can be to show a video. We're not gonna watch the whole thing, but we know the story. We're not doing too well. And we, as we see the temperatures increase, the effects on the earth are just dramatically spinning out of control. So this is the section, the science section, which is a little frightening. And it is, it depends on the group you have, but if it's a group that, that don't know or believe how urgent it is, you can do something like play them a video like this and show one or two of the graphs. And that should get them started, you know, in, in the direction of thinking that it matters. And I've seen this happen even with a scientist that I showed and they said, I had no idea. You know, and I guess they were a scientist in another field, right? So it's, it's really interesting. Um, so- And Colleen, sorry, once again, sorry to stop you. Uh, Rosemary has just asked, uh, do you have information of how scientists have determined the CO2 from a hundred, a thousand years ago uh, in case someone in the group asks? Yeah, for sure. In fact, in the facilitator resources, I'll just show you that page again, because I think that's a good idea to do that. Um,
sorry, I'm uh, actually going to have to open that one again. I shut that one. Um, so give me one sec, here we are. And so, yes, there's a, there's an awful lot of questions. And so one of the things we actually say is that if you get a lot of questions in your in your conversation that you actually haven't prepared for an answer, that you can always say you're going to follow up. But um, what was the question again, Mark? <laughs> yeah. So the question was, do you have information of how scientists determine the CO two from a hundred thousand years ago? In case, yeah, in case someone asks. <laughs> yes. Okay. So on this slide here, with all of that information about the uh, the carbon dioxide increasing, there is these two links here. Um, they are to a, a, a site called, the site that monitors the CO2 over time, and this is where you can find resources um, to that effect. Um, let's just see if I can, uh, so, so this one, uh, I'm just going to see if I can open that link, because I've gone back to my original here. Um, so. As I said, during your conversation, if you have a lot of questions that you're not prepared for, you can actually um, tell people you'll follow up with it. But I'm going to try sharing this link just to show you. This is actually a very cool site, even though it's a science site, I think you can see it now. It's called the Keeling Curve. And they've been, scientists have been monitoring this curve for a very long time and using historical records as best they could to piece things together. So, this is the Keeling curve and they're keeping this up to date, but they also have historic graphs. So if we can actually share, this is in the resource kit. Can, can other people see it? I can't actually see it right oh, now. I was about to say, yeah, it didn't show up on our screen and also that Lynn wanted to share. Okay. Okay. Hold on. I'll try it again. Can you see yep. it? Now? Yeah, okay. we see it now. Thank yeah. You. So the resources in the facilitator resources, they have loads and loads of links. You can either prepare ahead of time, decide you're going to try doing what I'm doing, which can be a bit awkward, or say that you can follow up. Um, so that, yeah. And Lynn? I was just going to say that if you're looking at long time ago, before they would have been measuring it in, in the atmosphere, uh, they check it with ice core samples. So I do believe ice core is the main method of, of looking historically at uh, the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere. Cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, there's some uncertainty, but there always is with science, right? They can never say it's 100% unless it's 100%. <laughs> and Ray is saying something there, I see. Oh, Mark, you're on mute. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Ray is saying that CO2.Earth tracks carbon dioxide as well. That cool. website, CO2.Earth. Cool. Okay, so, I mean, that's a science and it's pretty heavy. And once you've got your group in the know that it's urgent, we suggest in the conversation you take a pause and do an emotional check-in. So I'm going to hand it over to Rosemary to do one of those with us now. Thank you very much, uh, Colleen. Um, yeah, so uh, I find that uh, sometimes we end up having a lot of anxiety about this sort of thing. And um, sometimes that even turns people off. They don't want to know more. I know that with my own family members. They, they, they're afraid to ask me questions about, about climate because they're afraid to hear the answers. So um, I, that's why I think it's really important that we ground ourselves after you get hit with all this information. So um, we're going to just do this little exercise together. Um, so um, the first question, we have two sharing questions. Um, what are your feelings about the impacts of the climate crisis? What are your concerns, your fears, your hopes? And um, in, in the actual, when we actually do the climate a kitchen table climate conversations, we'd start with a quiet time of one or two minutes for personal reflection. Uh, you could take notes of your feelings if you want, and then uh, either type into the chat or, or read out loud to the group. So um, are we going to take a minute to just uh, model that? 
Colleen, yeah, okay. So, um, so just, just we, we'll, we'll do it a little briefer, I guess, but just take a few minutes to uh, come up with one or two points about, about um, your feelings when it comes to all this information. And yeah, we just put an S in the chat. Um, or I guess for a small enough group, you could raise your hand. Um, am I going to be monitoring the, that or, or you, Mark? I'm, I'm looking at it, yeah. Okay. So I can read them out or yeah. um, facilitate them to share based on the order. So um, Colleen wants to say something. I'll just, I'll model an example um, just for, for people, but yeah, I get when I, when I do this for, for, um, for people, sometimes I get uh, my anxiety builds as well, partly because I don't get to talk about it enough and people don't really want to hear about it. Um, so then, you know, when I get a chance to talk about it, it's <laughs> for some reason, even though it's a relief, the anxiety also rises because I think of how often I don't talk about it. So that that's, you know, that's partly what happens. Hi, Colleen. So a couple shares from the group. So Yun Chan Chan says, I feel very uncomfortable to see the injustice. Uh, and she also feels sad and depressed. Uh, Jay has written, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. So it's important to be connected to groups being proactive in climate work like Climate Fast, and also do, to do something to push back against the abyss. Um, and then Rosemary would like to share, and then after that, Tanya would like to share. Thank you. I, I feel, these days I feel frustrated more than anything else, because I feel like we've been talking about this forever. Um, and um, some people are getting it, but some people just still don't understand um, the depth to it, that it's not like, okay, we're gonna walk with a poster, and, Lockhart, and then three days later, everything will be okay. I'm not saying that's what the youth are doing, but um, there are as a contingent that that are uh, uh, people more my generation that are like that, and I find it very frustrating. Even the lack of basic knowledge, like I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Colleen, but I had that question, which was from somebody who was very skeptical. Well, how do you know what happened uh, 200,000 years ago? So it's kind of good to have the backup science knowledge. But anyway. Sorry, uh, frustration. Thanks, Rosemary. Tanya, do you wanna speak next? And then Wendy after that. Thanks for um, asking people to speak about this because you know, usually I don't wanna take up people's time with talking about how I feel, <laughs> but um, or at least I think I don't want to, but um, I'll say that uh, um, about a year and a half ago when when I realized just how the consequences of where we are now, just how bad they likely are going to be in the future and just how, how urgent it is that we change our ways. I was pretty traumatized and um, uh, yeah, I felt very def def deflated at different points. But at this point, I've kind of accepted now that we are, uh, the things, we just live in the time that we live in. So I'm just, I'm committed to doing what I can. And I think I basically accept that terrible things are probably coming to, you know, to many of us, lots of us. And then, and I, then I think I also have to be careful that I don't at a certain point protect my own happiness or people that I love at, the risk of not fighting for everybody, um, which is a hard thing to negotiate. I think if, if you're honest, I mean, as much as I'm, well, my actions would be fighting for things that are gonna benefit everybody. If um, that's another thing that I think I'm trying to, that I try to stay aware of. Yeah. 
Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Sharing. Um, Wendy, do you want to speak next? Do you want to share? Sure. Um, I just feel a lot of anger at this point. Um, uh, I guess I'm angry at the leaders around the world for their failure to educate and inform so that they've got, if it's a democracy anyway, um, a voting population that's educated and can understand why they're advocating for certain green and just uh, policies um, and stop with this game playing. You know, we just saw some craziness in the PC leader that uh, the carbon tax is not a is not a climate policy. I just, oh, so that whole distract and misdirect drives me nuts. And the other piece is the multinationals that are lying through their teeth, um, creating a smoke screen and putting a ton of money into lobbying the government um, daily, multiple times, so that they can get their policies through, which help them make short term gains. Um, and I have to say, I was really happy that I saw some oil companies recently um, declare some stranded assets and cancel dividend payments. I think their time has come, but I guess the issue for me is there are solutions, they're here, they're affordable, they're within our reach, and um, we can create a green and just recovery. We can have a better world for all, and it's affordable and it's cleaner. It just drives me nuts that we can, we can do it, but we need the will to do it. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Um, yes, I share many of the feelings of the people who have spoken. Uh, Valerie, do you want to talk next? Yeah, I find myself um, really relating uh, to what um, uh, the last uh, Tanya and, and Wendy have said. Um, yeah, like, I think I am in that traumatized state right now. I'm just kind of coming out of, as I said, um, being a very preoccupied teacher, very micro scale, you know, helping children and my heart was in the right place, but I wasn't fully cognizant of, you know, how desperate the situation was that I had my, I was so narrowly focused and I feel like that's the case with a lot of people still, obviously. And I have the, the, um, advantage of being retired and I have more time and like people are just run off their feet and so concerned about so many other things and the, and then on top of that the you know the the justice aspect of things like you know um like this whole issue with climate fast is you know getting going about doing some retrofits or helping with that program and it's so wonderful and we're recognizing you know that we have to be very careful because um you know who uh, you know where are the retrofits going to be and um and who's going to benefit from them and that kind of thing so there's it's just i don't know it's just overwhelming and then on top of that to have politicians playing games and not really um doing what they should be doing is very frustrating as well. Thanks, Val. I have an S in the chat, but um, maybe I'll wait. Uh, Natsuki, did you want to share? Yeah, thank you. So I'm kind of frustrated and having anxiety that when I talk to like people around me and then they don't really, they don't, we actually, we don't have that much opportunity to have climate climate change knowledge in like in the like a high school or those mandatory education because of that our generation like adult generation we don't really don't see the connection between how we live or how we consume like a lot of foods and food waste and, and or like energy consumption like excessively those are more connected to those people who are like mostly affected by climate change in the other part of the world, and also multinational corporations, those companies already, we are 
incorporated to like buying those things. And we don't really see how we are affecting and then causing those climate change. And we are talking about, oh, climate change is really bad. And then I'm so, I'm so afraid of it. But actually we don't see how we can change and how we can take an action and how we can create like a social action. So yeah, I think, yeah, someone said earlier, but education for adult and also children is so important in this, in this time, especially COVID-19. Yeah, this is my thought. Thank you. Mark, you have to unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Natsuki, for sharing that. Uh, Jay has written in the chat as well. Uh, they've said, leaders have failed us as our representatives. They've abandoned us and have misused the trust they've been given. As for those corporations with stranded assets, too bad. Let's hope for more of those. Thank you, Jay. Um, I, I will share um, quickly if that's okay. Um, yeah, uh, some of my favorite parts of Climate Fast meetings are, are briefly when we talk about our, our check-ins or, or our eco-anxieties and how we feel. It's so easy to get both overwhelmed from the disasters that are human-caused and we see are happening all over the world uh, and that are happening now um, and what it will be like in the future. I do think about uh, the intergenerational justice and thinking um, generations ahead um, and how scary that world could be um, and how unfair it is to, to those in the future, um, especially when we have the power to do something now. It's, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and then it's also easy to distract yourself. Um, and, and it's so important to continually bring up and, and uh, share your feelings, share your voice and, and take an action when possible. And of course, uh, echoing statements uh, from others uh, being being angry that this has been known about for so long and uh, so little has been done, but then also being appreciative that there are individuals and groups and indigenous peoples who have uh, been working and been fighting this unjust fight for so long um, that it makes me feel very hopeful and then also uh, very, uh, stressed as well, uh, kind of many emotions at once, I think. And um, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks. Um, Ray has shared in the chat. However, um, it's, I don't know if it's a personal share, but it's related to a previous conversation. So maybe that can wait for a minute. Yeah. Is there anyone else that would like to share that hasn't? I think that's it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. That was or Rosemary. Question. Um, in the sharing, Mark actually sort of started to transition us into it when he was talking about what gives him hope. So the second question is, what do you do to cope with these feelings if you do anything? Um, do you have some suggestions for the group of how to better deal with these feelings? And so same thing, just take a moment to think about it and then you could share your insights with the group, one or two points, um, same format, either speak or, or in the chat. I'll give you a minute to think and then maybe I'll model something myself. My battery is running low, so I better do this. And then I, if I uh, go dark, I'm still listening. I'm just plugging in my computer. Um, so for me, um, I am reminded that the Earth has been around much longer than humans, and um, that it will probably continue even if humans don't. Um, and that we came out of the Earth. The, the, the Earth has been around for billions of years, and the Earth processes make the conditions for us 
to exist in and to sustain us. And um, so I don't like thinking, you know, um, how humans have to save the world. Um, I like to go out in nature. And like when I say that, it doesn't mean you have to go up to Algonquin Park. You can, even if you're, you know, under quarantine COVID, you could look out the window at clouds or something, but um, in whatever way, get sort of reconnected with nature and realize that um, the earth is sustaining us. And if we let it, it will work with us. It has great regenerative um, capabilities. Um, and so it's not so much us saving the earth as finding ways to help the earth save us. And that gives me great hope. That's how I cope with things. Thanks, Rosemary. Yeah, Colleen has written in the chat that she works with others. She takes walks as well. I feel hopeful. Yun Chen Chen has wrote, written that uh, making sure uh, she has a group around her probably to talk about these issues with, as well as meditation. Uh, Tanya says to take action and balance that with engaging in other areas of my life that bring joy and meaning. Thanks. And Lynn would like to share next. I just wanted to say that it's important to work with the younger generation that get a lot of energy from Fridays for Future folks and youth and seeing how youth can bring the issue to the attention of, of a, a government uh, even more effectively than we can, and we can work together really well. So I think that plus, I think knowing that it's important to take breaks and, and savor nature, like experience nature, as well as take action on behalf of nature. Thanks, Lynn. Is there anyone else who would like to share, Val? Um, I agree with everybody and I do all those things. Um, but I also really push myself to learn and be informed. And then I never, I'm really trying hard to never miss a chance to um, speak about my learning to neighbors, friends, family, without being like overbearing. I just, you know, kind of say, I'm kind of new at this too, and I'm really concerned and sort of, I guess I'm learning the art of quiet conversations and hoping that uh, they'll amount to something. And I'm also getting pretty good at writing letters and talking to politicians as well. <laughs> Great, thanks, Val. Um, Ray has shared meditation, self-care, create joy and happiness for yourself and for your family and friends. Uh, Wendy has shared to vote green and let my liberal MP know they lost a vote due to an insufficient climate plan. Well, thank you everyone. That's, that's very actually helpful, all of that. Um, and so I'm going to take us into the next step and just look at um, the, the next section of the uh, slides, which is a little bit more hopeful. But first, I want to address. In, OK, I hope you can see that now. Um, just some of the conversation we had around the fact that the impacts of climate crisis are not just. Um, and this is a map that shows what happens as the world warms. Um, so this is four degrees and you can see that even now um, some areas are, are facing extreme problems, but it will just get worse in certain areas and less worse in other areas. And these are, and in North America in particular, we've benefited from fossil fuels, but we are not experiencing the biggest impact. So that's a justice issue. Um, and I just wanna read this one quote and then we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. But I really believe in my heart of hearts after a lifetime of thinking and talking about these issues that we will never survive the climate crisis without ending white supremacy. Here's why. You can't have climate change without sacrifice zones and you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people and you can't have disposable people without racism. Now that's from Hop Hopkins in an article called Racism is Killing the Planet but I think it's key to understand the interconnections between both the causes and the impacts of the climate crisis and, and injustice. 
Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the rest of the slides here in the impact section, but if you wanted to in your conversation, you could concentrate on national and provincial, or you could focus on health, or you could actually um, focus on more local things. But I want to move on a little quickly to... I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Lynn just wanted to share briefly. Okay. okay. That's okay. Could you just go back to that slide of the world? Um, that one, yeah. So just what I noticed about that, and I'm not sure if everybody saw this, but the yellow and brown, that's uninhabitable. That's at a four degrees, all those areas would be uninhabitable. And I also wanna show you um, that green band that you see in Africa, that is the green wall. That's where people are planting trees. So you can see that people are taking action in different places to try to um, build uh, resilience to the rising temperature. But you can also see that we just cannot have a world that becomes four degrees warmer. And we're on a trajectory to three plus degrees, four or five by the end of the century. So we really have to get off that trajectory. Um, yeah, so I think it's maybe useful to, like you'll decide with the group that you're working with, which slide to kind of take and talk to them and see um, what, where it registers. The point is for it to register that things are happening quickly, changing quickly, and we need to take action before it gets even worse, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And Colleen, sorry, just one last note was that earlier on, Ray wanted to reaffirm Lynn's point of saying analysis of air bubbles and ice cores drilled in Antarctica were used to determine CO2 content thousands of years ago. That's so just fascinating. That. fascinating. That's really cool. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I want to spend one second on the health impacts because those are so interconnected and, and we can see the same impacts from COVID. So this is a, a, an angle that might actually resonate with people as well when you're doing conversations. The impacts of climate change um, are degraded living conditions, um, food, threats to food supplies, uh, vector-borne disease, these are all very resonant with people seeing what the COVID crisis ca causes. So um, that's another entry point. And the opposite of that is the benefits that we have by taking climate action are health related as well. So better air quality, you know, even better fitness if we're not driving as much and we're doing more cycling. So there's, there's ways of um, getting at it from a health angle as well. Um, so we're gonna go, this is, we did this exercise already. In this section follows the coping exercises um, and it's the science of social change. And the good news is that working collectively has been known to make big changes. So one of the stat is a 3.5% rule. And so in Toronto, we need 85,000 people to join the movement to push for change. And then at that point of um, nonviolent action of that number of people, it has been shown to, to make change. So working together, the point of that slide is that working together is really important and getting um, more people to understand and collective action. So you can show this little video as well if you want, or instead of, of talking about it and have the video talk for you. But this video is 25% of people to actively promote change in behavior in a community. So this is like modeling for your neighbors. So it's 25% of people adopt a new behavior. And this was done online in an online community. Then it became more of the norm for other people to do the same things. So it, it does matter what we do and in, in, in who we talk to. And this is another way of looking at it um, is supporting each other in making change um, can be like social collective actions, very important stories of success you know, finding when you've made progress, sort of resting on it and saying, here's the progress we made. I would suggest in a conversation, if you have a story that resonates with you, that is personal to you of success from working together, that's something that's really cool to share. Um, we had a story from a group of school children who wrote, we have in our toolkit, wrote letters to their city councillor and they made change. They got what they asked for by coming together and, the, and having the, the children in the school actually write this letter campaign. So things can make a difference. And it's important maybe to point that out to your group so that there's a little bit of hope and a little bit of movement toward collective action. Um, so 
I'll check in with Mark here. Yeah. Great. I'll, stop, I'll stop screen sharing for a minute. Yeah. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so Tanya has written, uh, was the study done pre-social media? I think that's the 3% study. Uh, that one, I, I don't, I don't think so, but the research stems back pre-social media because it's in different countries and it was like social upheaval, political change. So, you know, it, it, it certainly predates social media, the research, but the study is fairly recent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lynn has written, Erica Chenoweth has a TED talk from 2013. Her research was done earlier than that, but has been done just in the last, in the few years before that. So, mm -hmm. right. And uh, Rosemary has said, we saw this in Toronto, I, people working together, when last September's huge climate strike spurred city council to unanimously adopt the climate emergency declaration. Yeah. That is such a good example. It's so inspiring. Yes. Yeah. And, and Jay has written, um, I think this was to the previous slide, uh, changes in vector ecology. We're living it today. Mm -hmm. I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's great. I'm going to go, the next section that I want to start because this is going to, we're going to try a few participatory things as well. So when you're doing your conversation, in order to engage on Zoom, as you see, you have to be a little creative. You have to use chat, but you can also use a real-time editing document. So we're going to try that in the next section. And the next section is about uh, envisioning a low carbon future, a better world. So I'm just going to quickly share a few more slides. And I know Tanya has to go at eight, right? So thank you for coming, Tanya. And I see Sharon's arrived. So <laughs> we've got a- We're trading off. Thank you so much. Bye, you know, for our kids might somehow host a kitchen table conversation as well. So I can bring this information with them. Thanks. Cool. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Tanya. Okay. Okay. So, can you see the Earth? Yes. Okay. Cool. So these slides, the next slides, you can choose to cho use them or not, or or you know, as as usual, to sort of center on what you want to center on. But they've been chosen to show us why we need to act and where we can act. So this one shows that in Canada, look at that big red mark. Our per capita emissions are terrible compared to the rest of the world. So when you, some of you mentioned changes to our lifestyles, this is something we do need to really look at here. Um, and so when people say, a lot of people say Canada's small, it doesn't matter what we do, or you know, Canada's pretty good, you can actually refer to our per capita emissions and say, no, it matters what we do here. In, in our country. This is a really good graph from um, Oxfam that shows that 10% of people, the wealthiest people, are responsible for about half of emissions. And it also ties in that um, a select group of billionaires are going to fight tooth and nail to maintain the status quo because they're the ones who benefit. And they're usually connected with fossil fuel wealth. So what this shows to me is that we have to do something um, about both climate justice and racial justice and also connected with fossil fuel. Like we have to really, Canada is a very much um, dependent as we know on and wanting to build pipelines. So that is a focus in Canada that I think is important. Um, so you can emphasize that if you want. Um, and I see Mark. Hi Colleen, sorry, just um, on the previous slide, Yun Chen Chan is asking if you can explain the CO2 units people asked I, and I don't know how to explain. So just a science question. Okay, so you're asking the percentage of the CO2 emissions. You're, are you asking um, how the CO2 works in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide? It's a buildup of, um, there is a natural balance or has been a natural balance of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And the fact that we're, we're pumping all this um, emissions we're pumping all the fossil fuel emissions and nitrous oxide and a few other emissions into the atmosphere means that the natural balance is disrupted, the heat is building up, and also the CO2 levels are becoming out of balance. So it's just, it's a lot of emissions um, and they're all measured in different ways. But uh, yeah, Thanks. does that help at all? <laughs> can I, and Lynn can I like just jump in? Yeah. Uh, it's Lynn and I'll just say that we, uh, you know, late 1800s, there was perhaps 270 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And there's now 400 and 
15, at least it may be higher than that now. Um, and it's rising fairly quickly. We do have a slide that shows the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's that percentage in the atmosphere that um, is creating the blanket that's keeping the heat in. And that's what, what keeps the heat rising. So that might be an explanation people would understand. And there is a slide, uh, I'm sure somewhere in our resources for that. Right, Colleen? Yeah, Yes, thanks. there is. And that's right at the beginning, under the basic science, you'll find more about that. And um, so, yeah. Okay, so just moving on a little more quickly then, um, again, in Canada, we see oil and gas industry is the most emissions. So it's something that we need to come together to work uh, on is getting Canada to change direction on that. Um, and there we go again, we see Canada is gonna be responsible for development, so much development compared to the rest of the world in the next few years, if we go ahead with all our infrastructure. Um, so these are just ways to access um, points of action for people. And this is the provincial level here and the Auditor General report. These two graphs are from the Auditor General report. And of course, since the current uh, government has come in in Ontario, as she notes, action on climate has backtracked incredibly. And a lot of sort of counter, counter actions have happened like canceling the um, renewable projects and pulling out charging stations for electric vehicles. She actually, the Auditor General actually shows that that has made a tremendous difference already in our, in our backstepping on the provincial level. So these slides, I wouldn't um, necessarily spend an awful lot of time on them, but I, they're, uh, they're ways for people to figure out where they can take action and where the solutions are needed. I wanted to rest on this one a little bit more because the local level might be important to the group that you're in, wherever you are doing your, where, wherever your pe the people are that are attending your conversation, they might wanna know where they can take action on the ground in their community. And one of the things we've suggested is figuring out whether the community has a climate plan or not. If it doesn't, pushing for a climate plan. And if it does, helping support that plan. So that's one big thing people could do on a local level together. And, and so we did, uh, I think I left this one blank because this is also a space for you to come up with what's happening in your area and help people connect with it. So I'm just going to touch briefly on the individual action slide here. This is from Kairos and they show what the most impactful actions we can do personally are. We also have a link to the reducing my footprint exercise from Diane Sachs, which is a very good one. In the conversation, depending on the group you have, you might want to spend some time looking at that document or looking at personal um, carbon emissions. Um, or you might decide that you don't want to spend a lot of time on it. So it depends on your group. It is a starting point for people, a, an entry point for them to understand action and what they can do. So I'm going to, Mark, just give me one sec. I'm just going to quickly, if I can, show this document and then we'll go and have questions. So unfortunately, that means stop share and start share, but I can be quick on that now. There, can you see it now? Okay, so this is Diane Sachs. Our, um, so she shows where our emissions come from and what we can do about them. She has the best options, medium level options, and the and, uh, worst options, driving a pickup truck, truck, for example. So, and the best op option is not driving at all. So you can see what you can do and where our emissions come from on an individual level. And I love what she says at the end too, which is this is a great place to start, but a terrible place to stop. Will you speak up <laughs> about climate and, and action that we need? So I'm going to actually stop sharing and let Mark, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. Um, so Ray has said that uh, currently there is 414.38 ppm as of uh, July, 2020. Wow. Um, and, and then after that, Lynn would like to share. Okay, Lynn, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to say if that, uh, the one from Kairos that you had up for a minute there, I, I find it interesting because people often mention recycling. It's something that, it's an environmental action law people are very familiar with and think it's really good and helpful. And it is good to do it, but you'll see that it doesn't save very much in terms of, of 
our emissions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a useful discussion for people to think about it. And part of the reason we do this footprint piece is also to look at the amount you save. If our foot footprint is somewhere between 15 and 20 tons per year on average for uh, per capita, which showed them some of our previous slides, then it reducing by one, uh, you know, or half or a quarter of, of a ton is not really making a significant difference. So the point is that while we can reduce our emissions and that's useful to do, we really require collective action and government action policy changes in order to actually get significant decreases in emissions that we really need, the big cuts that we need, which is about seven and a half uh, percent per year for this whole decade. That's from the International uh, Panel on Climate Change, the Governmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so we do this partly to look at, well, what can we do as individuals and also what more do we have to do? So that leads into this exercise, I think. Yes, it does. But I think there might be another comment, Mark. Is that right? So Jay has said that the Cairo slide used here doesn't mention the other one about how one child less has the greatest impact of all. So there's one additional document that uh, I will copy and paste into the chat. Um, and then additionally to that, Rosemary would like to speak. Okay, so just to answer that about the Kairos document, they revised it because the one child um, uh, comment or, or, or um, signifier was quite controversial. You have to discuss racial justice. You have to discuss all of the things that come with saying population and having children is a, is um, so, so basically our footprints here in North America are so large that that if we decrease our per capita footprint, it, it makes more of a difference than that's what we need to be aiming for. So everyone's footprint is reduced rather than, you know, um, it, the child issue is just so fraught for so many reasons. And I mean, I once had a young mom come up to me in tears because she said she was so guilty for having a child. And so it's just, there's so much around it. And Kairos actually kindly revised this document with all of these things in mind for, uh, not just for us, I don't think Lynn, but at one of our, one of our requests was for that because I love the document, but that was just, it's a big conversation. Yeah, but thanks Jay, it's true. It's a big conversation. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, so Rosemary. Then, yeah, just really quick. Uh, I don't know if, if, if uh, Yuan Chan really got an answer to her question. It's a, just a really basic science question. The, the units of carbon are parts per million. So basically every molecule of in the atmosphere. Um, right now there's whatever you said it was 415 molecules of carbon dioxide for every million um, molecules in the, in the atmosphere. Um, and you know, there's ways they can measure that. And that is really, really high because carbon dioxide is one that's supposed to be a very low percentage of, of, of um, in, in the atmosphere. You know, oxygen is 6% um, or something and nitrogen is really high. Um, but that's part per million, that's, that's what that measurement is. I don't know if that helps you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that helps, Rosemary. And actually that is in the very first slides, which I would try to go back to, but I think I might mess everything up if I do. So thank you. That was a really a great ex explanation. Um, so for this, if this is, um, if this is a, a good point, I would like to do the next part to just to show you how you can do like a group exercise. Because the next part of the um, conversation stems around us going into the, that Lynn led into really well. Um, so I'm gonna share the screen again and show you that um, exercise. Um, so we move from an individual footprint to this, what I call the quadrant, where we, we ask people to think of an action they're keen on doing on the individual level, and then look at industry and business, government and community levels, and see what we need to support widespread action, to support our action and get it to be collective and widespread. So there's a couple ways you could run this exercise for people. One is in chat and one is in real time. <clears throat> so I'm gonna see if you can remember, we're starting with individual and we're gonna move and we're gonna think of industry, government and community levels. 
I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to check in with Mark. And then after that, if we can put in chat something we're really keen on taking action on and then how we need action on other levels to support that. This is one way to run an exercise like this. So I see there's lots going on in the chat. It's still trying to answer some questions about the science. Hi, Colleen. Yeah, so um, Yun Chen Chen had asked, if a million molecules, only 415 are CO2, uh, Rosemary has said it's a powerful heat holding molecule. And Lynn has made the comparison that uh, it has a powerful effect. And pre-industrialization, 200 years ago, it was 270 ppm. Uh, so having that, that comparison helps. Uh, Lynn has also written that there are also other greenhouse gases, including methane, that also contribute to the greenhouse effect, creating, creating a kind of blanket that keeps the warming in and raises the temperature. Does that help more? Great. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Yeah, so if you could think of an action um, uh, on the indiv individual level that you're, you think you might take or are interested in trying to take, we'll try to make some connections to see how to make that collective. If you could just put in the chat, that would be great. Is, is this individual actions coming? Yeah, start, and... start with an individual action, something okay. you're keen on doing yourself. Okay, yes, vote. <clears throat> And so what, when you're voting, what did you want, what do you want to see happen or change on other levels? Um, so for voting, um, for me, what comes to mind, just to give you an example, is on the government level, let's change our electoral system so that when we vote, it matters more. So it's not first past the post. So that would be something on the government level that we need to change in order to make our vote matter more. Riding a bike is a really good one. What do you need at a community level to help you with riding your bike? Mm. Yes, <laughs> bike lanes. So we need that switching up gas powered furnace. Yeah, that's a good one. Bike education, yes. So on a government level, we need safe cycling infrastructure too, don't we? So that's mm. something we could come together to ask for. Um, so switching a gas powered furnace for an electric one, all right, what do you need to help you do that, Rosemary? Me? I need money. <laughs> money, exactly, incentive. Uh, maybe and some help, you know, mm -hmm. like a retrofit thing or if, if there's a plan. I know they're working on renewable natural gas, but I don't know if that's going to ramp up fast enough. Yeah, yeah, on the industry level, yeah. So I see, we're going to do a couple more. Um, climate justice is the top priority, be clear on that. Yes, yes. And for that, we kind of need that on all levels, don't we? We need it in industry. We need it all through our society. But I think, Wendy, at a government level, that's really key right now, isn't it? You know, to push for a just recovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's look at the reducing instead of recycling, because that leads to a really interesting thing on the industry level, doesn't it? What do we need on an industry level to help us reduce? Who put that one in? Was it? Uh, let me see. Oh, yes. And I would say you need um, them to pr not produce plastics that you can't recycle or to use like not plan obsolescence, you know, no planned obsolescence anymore. Circular economy, perfectly phrased, Wendy. That's what we need. Um, so this is cool. This is working really well in chat. I'm just going to move over to the other method to show you it as well. Um, and you can keep putting in chat, but I'll need Mark to help me with this. Sure. Um, so what I've done is I've prepared a document where I can actually write on it. Um, and we can write in real time if you want, if you're brave enough to do that. <clears throat> and if you have someone like Mark to help you or, or even not, um, the, uh, the object here is that you can actually write in real time. So you can put people's ideas in here. So Mark, just read out one. Sure. Um, so one of them is uh, government incentives for retrofits. Mm -hmm. So that would be in the, in a different section. That would be in the government section. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that helps you with your switching out of um, your gas furnace and everything to do with changing your house. Yeah. Uh, so an individual action that you could take, Sharon has written, change your diet. Uh, so reduce meat drastically and what meat you eat should be sustainably raised. Yeah, and so that's business, the farming. Uh, okay. Great. Um, Lynn has written a higher carbon price. Uh -huh. That's the government level for sure. Okay, so we'll take one more and then... Uh... Sure. Um, uh, Val has written uh, redirect funds from fossil fuel subsidies. And government yes, well. I would say that's both an industry change and a government change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so that would create industry change. Very and directly. Colleen, if I could add one more so we could have another community one. Uh, sure. Lynn has written a solar co-op neighborhood. A, oh, I, a love community that. Initiative. I love that. Okay, so as you see, you get a pretty beautiful um, group think out of this, like a group diagram in the end. And I will show you just what happens in real life. It's really fun. It's kind of messy, but this is what you get in real life <laughs> when you're doing a flip chart version. The conversation is amazing. Um, I love this one, entertain in a better world. You'd entertain yourself, you'd have showers and skits at church and you'd play crocono. You know what I mean? Like what a little idyllic vision of a better world. So it is really a fun exercise and to do it online is a little tricky, but I think we showed that it can be done. That was really cool. Um, so the next part of this, I wanted to try in a breakout and Ray's gonna help us with the breakout. But we move from the quadrant exercise into envisioning a better world in the kitchen table climate conversations, trying to picture what a, a low carbon world, a greener, healthier, just future would look like together so that we have a note of hope. So Ray, is, my question for you is, what would that better world look like for you? And we're gonna break out. So we'll be, we'll be in groups, I think of four, Ray, if I'm remembering correctly. And um, right. we're gonna spend like maybe, let's spend only five minutes, Ray, just because we're behind a little. Um, in our breakouts. Okay. okay. Um, opening the room. Yeah. Sarah, would you would you like to share something to the group, a vision that you had that you shared with me and Rosemary? <laughs> Great. Yeah, I was talking about um, the aspect of um, incorporating or advocating issues to do with climate change and environment within education sector that is in uh, in schools and uh, right from the daycare level all through all levels of uh, education and then we also talked about um, advocating uh, with the government and uh, municipal on uh, on the, the licensing bodies especially those in charge of new and upcoming buildings to ensure that renewable energy and um, ways to reduce um, wastage or conserve water is incorporated in the building policies or building license so that at least there is, for example, if you're approving a, an upcoming building, there's the option of solar energy or uh, you know putting taps, smaller uh, size taps to reduce the amount of water going through. So those are some of the areas. Can't remember some, maybe Mark or Rosemary may be able to help me here. Thanks, Sarah. I think you summarized your points very well. Yeah, uh, Rosemary had also shared uh, in the education realm that Sarah was talking about regarding um, outdoor classrooms and, and experimental learning in, in nature and getting children attuned to it while learning in those spaces. So I thought that was a nice addition to that. To that thought. Yeah, if, if you'd like to share, you can put an S or uh, if you want to share verbally, put an S or just type in your vision in the chat and I can share it. Lynn, do you want to type yours in or just share it? It was kind of cool. The last thing oh, you said. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I said that more local activities that are low carbon intensive as in less flying and more sort of staying at home and doing activities in nature or in your own community. Um, and Sharon added that 
you can get on Zoom and you can actually be even more global because you connect with people in any part of the world um, online so that it's opened up in a way, both those worlds in a different way than we were experiencing before. And that's through COVID, but those would also help us um, to continue the kinds of, um, of reductions in fossil fuel emissions that have happened under COVID, if we could continue some of those. Yeah, I'll add working at home. I think, you know, some people have found that really freeing and um, we'd like to continue that at least partly. So that's kind of cool as well. Um, and that has made a difference. So, um, okay, so if everybody's okay with it, I'm going to just move on to the very last part. I have a few people who um, I'm gonna have share some ongoing actions. Um, this is the actions and solutions part. And I'm just going to screen share a couple of really cool things that are happening. And then I'm gonna pass it on to the people in this group that are doing things that are kind of exciting. So let's just see. So the action, some of them that are happening, one of them is this just recovery for all movement and where we're demanding um, it's, there are seven shared principles that different groups are using in different ways to ask for a just and green recovery from COVID. Um, and I'm just um, really, the graphics, they were donated by a, an artist very kindly um, and they're beautiful. They're on the website, just recovery for all. And so are the um, long versions of these principles, like put people's health and well-being first, no exceptions. There's a long version of that. And um, they're all on that website. And it's um, also a bunch of groups that are working together for the just recovery are on in the, what they call the yellow pages on that site. So you can see different organizations you can support or amplify their messages. Um, and everyone is right now, of course, really targeting the um, government because they're coming up with their recovery budget. Um, and everyone is using a lot of people I see, which I'm very pleased about, are using this framework of a just recovery for all, which is pretty cool. So that is one thing. Another way of looking at it is the Green New Deal. And there's some videos in this kit. You could show one of these short videos if you wanted to your group. Green New Deal is also a comprehensive interconnected plan to, uh, for, for justice and climate justice. Um, and so it's kind of cool. There is a bill in the house. There's also a bill for emergency climate action framework. So these are things that we can actually get behind and support. And you might've heard of Drawdown. Drawdown is full of hope. There's so many solutions and they've got their new book, their 2020 book of Drawdown solutions out at drawdown.org. And there are probably many access points to support any one of those solutions, um, like wind energy and um, education for girls and women. There's a really broad range and they all are assessed for their climate impact and their social impact. So it's really, really kind of a cool program. So this, this section is for your climate conversation participants to sort of get an idea of what they can do and get behind. There's a graphic here about intersectional environmentalism you could show on Instagram if you want. Just click the link. And of course, as you saw with me, you'd have to stop share and start share again to, to work it, which is a bit cumbersome. But um, so I see there might be some chat. So I'm going to just pause and then we'll do the very last exercise. And then we'll have the people speak that are in the group about their current exercises. So Mark, is there something? Lynn has just shared that uh, she, we can also talk about a green new decade, um, that idea um, yeah. as a solution. I don't know if you want to speak okay. more to that, Lynn. Yes, um, I wanted to say that uh, Colleen was showing that one page that has like nine different options of where you might want to go in the discussion. Mm -hmm. So you can find out which your group um, is interested in because we, because we keep these groups small, you can custom design the discussion part of, of the event with your group in mind and actually with them at this point um, in the conversation, you might say, what would you like to talk about more? I wanted to mention that we really need for every part of Ontario to have a climate action plan. Some parts of Ontario, the climate emergency declaration has been made uh, by the local governments. And it was mentioned earlier that Toronto made this declaration. Uh, Toronto also has a climate action plan, but something only like 4% of all the municipalities in Canada 
have a climate action plan. Uh, we think that if um, people started pushing their local governments to do the consultation to create a climate action plan, this would start to create momentum and awareness that is gonna translate into accountability when it comes time for the next election, which is 2022, that it won't be possible for candidates to run without a real understanding of what they're doing. And they won't be able to just say, oh, here's, uh, we're, we're um, concerned about climate because even the Ford government has what they call their climate action plan, feature of which is beach cleanup and you know dealing with littering and things like that that are not significant. But if you've got an educated, population that actually understands what has to be in a plan and the plan is being developed locally, then um, uh, they, they will have to be much more accountable. So that's one thought that and one area that you could go on, but you also could, uh, like people may want to join existing groups, depending what's going in their community, or they may want to uh, you know, establish Lynn, a group. They may want to. Actually, that's the whole. Lynn, you are entering into the whole next section. But Sorry. thank you very much. Oh, okay. I, thought, I thought that's where we were at. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you can um, can yeah. you continue that thought in two minutes? Okay. I'll come back yeah. to you because you're doing it really well, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let you do it. But just okay. I wanted to. I felt a little bit like I wanted to show the how the Instagram thing would work. So if you want to show um, something live like this. It's really cool and a little dy dynamic. So that was the link. The link is in the presenter slides. And so you can use it if you want. Um, and this is a definition of inclusive, inclusive version of environmentalism that advocates for both the protection of people and the planet. It identifies the ways in which injustices happen to marginalized communities and how they are interconnected with injustices that happen to the earth. It brings injustices done to the most vulnerable communities and the earth to the forefront and does not minimize or silence social inequality intersectional environmentalism advocates for justice for people and the planet. So that's part of the just recovery as well. And this little Instagram thing um, from her, her name is Lei. She has a whole bunch of things that groups like ours can do to make sure that we are being intersectional and, um, and inclusive. And so it's really, really cool. And I, I thought, I said it was complicated to show, but it really isn't, especially if you have, a, you have this pre set up on your Safari when you're doing your conversation. And so you just have to make sure that you choose it when you say share, it'll picture will come up and you have to choose it. And, and it's, so it's not that complicated. And in fact, we're here to help you even with the breakouts. I know that we didn't explain how they were done. So we're going to follow up with some sort of technical notes and you're welcome to reach out to us if you're holding conversation, we can even set up the zoom for you. So um, we're not doing a lot of explanation of the technical stuff tonight, not as much as you might need, but we're here. Please reach out to us um, if you need to set something up or you need a fuller explanation. So on that note, Lynn, I'm going to go back to moving on. Um, can we just uh, try this exercise and then I'm going to let um, Lynn speak and Sarah speak and also um, Rosemary about some things that are that are going on. So this exercise that Lynn touched on, the idea is that your group will choose one that they're keen on looking at in a little more detail. And this is what you take to your elected officials and ask for and push for. So I don't know if any of you have had a chance to read it and are keen on any one of these numbers. Um, somebody want to throw one of them out? Like we have Climate emergency declaration, uh, making it meaningful. Stop spending public money to subsidize fossil fuels. I know somebody mentioned that in chat. So maybe we should look at that one. So I suggest when you're running a conversation that you have the group decide on one, just to give them an example of how they can advocate for a certain thing from government. So there's lots and lots of details in each of these slides. Um, and in this one, for example, if you want to talk about um, uh, ending fossil fuels, you can talk about redirecting the subsidies. <clears throat> you can talk about um, how the carbon budget is actually going to be used up by the existing oil fields, you know. Anyway, there's lots of references in each of these points. And so you might ask your elected officials to reject new, new fossil fuel projects. And you might back that up with some of these um, reports, that, um, details from the reports that show we just can't develop any more fossil fuel and meet our carbon budget. So this is a resource that you might use with your group. 
And if somebody's keen, for example, also on indigenous rights, there's a whole page on that. There's a little video you can show. Or if they're keen on a just transition for workers, there's a little video there too. <laughs> so it's just a resource for you. Um, and you won't be able to go through it all. You can always send it to your attendees as well. So they can take a look at what we can ask for. Um, difference on the, uh, the national level and levels too. But that is the last thing I wanted to share. And now I want what, to move to um, what Lynn was starting to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's on the supporting yeah. one another section? Okay, what the supporting one another section, we can go there. You were starting to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so that is finding a local group to join. It's um, looking for you to miss whether you have a climate plan on a local level or not and pushing for it if you don't. Um, taking the pledge program. There's, a couple, there's one called Climate Pledge Collective and that is a good way to get people engaged and to take pledges for climate action. You can of course talk to your friends and families and coworkers, do a KTCC, organize a community event where you talk about the climate or a Zoom event. Um, you can also um, just advocate to your local, uh, your elected officials by signing letters, writing letters, signing petitions, talking to them. It's always best, isn't it, Lynn, if you can actually talk to them in person, that's probably the most impact. So phone calls. Yep. Yep. So, so what I'd like to add, thank you, Colleen, for that, is that you may not want to show this page because it's a little overwhelming and we don't actually want to overwhelm people at the end of the discussion. We really want the, the discussion that you host uh, to be one that is friendly and warm and informal and allows people to talk about their feelings, ask the questions that they have, find out a little bit more and hopefully be motivated to want to meet again uh, in the future um, and to, um, to take some action. So you don't want to necessarily, so you want, to, you want to fit in whatever parts of this seem to make sense to the group that you're yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, and you might do a go round and ask people, what would you like to do next? Would you We're like to get together again? We're going to do a poll next um, after this to ask what people oh, okay. are Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. But if, so, if people oh. say, so I'll just wrap up by saying, if people say they would like to meet yeah. again, then you might think about what, what theme they want to meet on or they just want to get together, but to keep the ball rolling so yeah. that, uh, and for people to feel supported. Yes. That's it. Thank you. Right. Um, Lynn, that, thank you very much. I was actually going to end with the what's next section, but we've done it a little earlier than the very end. And my, my point was going to be that, yeah, ask if they need, um, they want to be connected. If you don't have their emails already, make sure you've got people's emails. You can follow up, um, ask if there's something they keen, keen that they want to work on together and kind of try to facilitate that. Um, but yeah, I guess what you're saying is this slide has too much in it. We didn't spend any time in the KTTC talking about how you advocate at a government level. So I hear the feedback from Lynn that I need to revise this slide because I do want to have some of that in there so people know how they can, uh, what they need to do at a government level. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a look again at this slide and make it a little simpler because I want to leave you with some options to give your group at the end for action as well. Um, but I want to actually give you time now, uh, um, Sarah and Rosemary, to talk about an action that you are doing. So I'm going to stop sharing. That's it for the sharing. And I'm going to call on uh, Rosemary first. Rosemary is working on an initiative with the KTCCs now. So I'd like we can hear about it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just a little background. I, I, I'm a graduate student in eco-theology. So I am also do a lot of stuff with faith groups. And I think that uh, you, went on, you might find this really interesting is that there's a new group called For the Love of Creation. At the moment, it's mainly Christian. We're trying to reach out to be more interfaith, but they are designing a faith-based uh, kitchen table conversation to take to your congregations. Um, they hope to launch it in September. Um, which is the season of creation. Many Christian churches mark September 1st to, 4th, uh, to October 4th as the season of creation. And they're developing three levels for people that are not, not yet part of the conversation that really don't know anything, or people that are, are, do know something and understand it from a faith perspective, uh, that they can become more engaged. 
Um, and then a third level of the people that are quite knowledgeable, like yourself, that need support in leadership and how can you lead a community uh, or a group in your, in your faith community. Um, so it's, uh, they, their website isn't up yet, but it's for the love of creation, Kairos, uh, Faith in the Common Good, and a large number of other groups across Canada are involved in this initiative. Um, and I think you can join their mailing list, though. I think Mark was going to put that link in. And so that's their main pillar that's associated with kitchen table conversation. They also um, are, um, have a, an advocacy group and they have a petition out right now um, for the House of Commons about reduction in emissions, a just transition, um, respecting UNDRIP and making sure that the global south, um, the mechanisms are in place for the global south and it starts off saying as a person of faith. So we have the link to that e-petition too. So anybody who's a person of faith, or even if you just sort of feel some sort of spiritual kinship with the earth, it doesn't matter. Um, there is a, this petition it's, and it's um, sponsored by Nathan Erkson. Uh, I can't remember. Nathaniel Erskine Smith. Thank you. And he's an, a, a liberal MP. So, um, and that's open for a few more months. And then there's, Third pillar is um, more theological side of people who, you know, I know ecotheology, even in the theological school that I go to, a lot of people don't even know what that is, right? So um, they're working at having a symposium um, coming up again in the fall. Um, so if you go to the, if you sign up to get their emails, you'll get more information about that. Cool. And, um, so if you're a person of faith, that might be another way to enter enter into that's uh, awesome. action. That's so many things, Rosemary. I didn't know you were doing all of that. That's great. Okay, and, and Sarah, I wanna hear about your actions. All right, thank you so much. So for us as Africa Climate Action Initiative, what we are basically doing, we have three pillars. So one of it is uh, on sensitization. And uh, what we're doing is uh, just talking a lot about um, climate change. And this we are doing both uh, here in Canada and also in Africa. At the same time, we brought uh, our partners from Africa together, you know, the eight countries that we are working in, so that we can link them and uh, try and uh, identify resources. So here in Canada, I'll just talk what we are doing here in Canada. Uh, number one, we are targeting to speak to the newcomers on uh, waste management and also we are going to support uh, on the issues of um, bike riding. So in terms of uh, training, you know, organizing where there's a youth group around here that can train people who are interested in bike riding, and then we can start sensitizing on the issues of taking uh, bikes. We are also providing a knowledge portal whereby we'll be able to share. Then we also spearheading the um, facilitating and initiating climate clubs or environment clubs in learning institutions and out of school institutions. So those are major things that we're going to do. But above all, we are so passionate about the kitchen table climate conversation. And that is why we are here, because we want it to be one of the things that we'll be doing both here and in Africa. And with time, we're going to tailor make the same uh, training that you're getting from here and tailor make it to suit the African partners, you know, and hopefully even we'll be able to do it in French because we have one of our partners who's speaking in French. So that is what we are doing and even in local languages like Swahili. So that is what we are doing. And um, we also envision that um, We've identified one uh, partner who is a Canadian organization that is also doing a lot of media sensitization in Africa, especially for farmers. So we want to use that platform also and uh, talk about uh, climate change. Yes, thank you. Wow, <clears throat> that's a lot, of, a lot of things again I didn't know about. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I have to take a closer look at your resources there in the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, is there anyone else who has something they want to mention that they're keen on doing or doing at this point? No. Okay, that's great. So let's just try one more thing. Let's try a poll, like um, Lynn suggested, um, and uh, and I'm going to ask Ray to set it up. And this is something that you can do to be more interactive too in your conversations. But it's a good way for to close out. It's going to ask 
something about what you want to do next. And then you can finish by saying a few things about what people could do next. So let's try the poll. It, you can vote. If not, then we'll just move. Okay, do you want to share it, Ray? Okay. There we go. So you can see what people are keen on. And um, we had a really a real division here. I mean, as far as um, um, people have a widespread interest, that's really cool. Two people for the circular economy. And then um, we have volunteering for climate justice group, opposing fossil fuel infrastructure, advocating for just recovery, holding a KTCC, and energy efficiency. That is so cool. So, um, so that's really cool, and that's exciting. And that gives some. If you do something like that at the end of your conversation, it gives people something to hold on to that they might be a little. Um, <laughs> circular economy wins. That's cute, right? Um, you know, something to hold on to and move forward with. And as Lynn was saying, um, at the end of your conversation, you can ask if people need anything um, to support them in something that they want to do, um, if they want to stay in touch, if they want to have a part two conversation, if they want to have help facilitating their own. Um, so I thought maybe we could just go around and do a checkout and see if anybody has anything that they um, has has anything right now that any final questions or something they'd like us to follow up with or something keen that they just want to say about next steps. So I'm going to start actually with um, with uh, the first person on my screen, Yuan Chen. <laughs> oh, I think you have to unmute. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I lose track. What do you want me to say, Colleen? Oh, you yes. you. If you if you have any last minute questions or comments or anything that you just want to oh share. okay no uh, the comment um I had typed it not for tonight about the donation after Sarah had has shared um sometimes I I I, I join some webinar or, or so and and I don't like the donation request saying chip five dollars this is a comment I just want to let you know it's unsafe for my generation to do something like this and give us some way to write check or pay by PayPal and with then I can receive a, a receipt, something like that. My generation regarding, we want to support if, if money. Second, this kind of conversation training is fantastic. Tonight is really resourceful and, and, and I feel the big support, I'm not alone. I go back there, I'm alone, and, and but here I feel so many people are doing different things and we can contribute and support. So what I'm asking is, can we, for example, three of us in a group to share um, or email and what we are doing? Oh, can I ask you this question? Not very frequent, I understand everybody's busy, but if we can have support like this, not wait for the whole year to have one thing like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? When I'm going out there doing the kitchen conversation, I, I do it five consecutive, consecutive week, and I'm doing three months every Sunday morning. So so I, I, I'm so looking for it, but I need support. And so many things I don't understand and I don't know how to answer when they ask me those questions. So if we have a, maybe we can have a small group of support like this. So yeah, that's I a great idea. I love that idea. Definitely, let's follow up on that. I see Sharon has, a, we can monitor a support email account. That's an idea. <laughs> great idea. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the next person on my screen is Wendy. Yeah, this has been um, terrific. It's a great resource. Uh, I belong to, a, I guess it's a book video club, but I also belong to a larger group, which is just on climate change. Um, it's through the Life Institute, which is affiliated with Ryerson. So I'm going to bring some of this information back to them. Um, there's quite a wide variety of people doing a whole bunch of different things. And uh, it'd be interesting to know if, if they've even, if they're even aware that this particular resource exists, because those are people that are already 
doing things um, from this perspective and they might be able to make use of this tool. So thank you for putting this together. You're welcome and that's a great idea too, my goodness. Uh, all right, so Natsuka, Natsuki, can if you pronounce your name again for me, I'll get it next time. Oh, uh, Natsuki. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you so much for this, such a really great, yeah, meeting. It's really informative and I learned so much from you guys' presentation. And I also feel like, yeah, because yeah, we are in the general life, we sometimes feel like, oh, I'm alone to think about this, like a climate change, but actually we are, yeah, there are so many people that are concerned about climate change. And then this is a really great opportunity to talk about and then go deeper the information and scientific knowledge and so we can share it with other people as well and also i learned how to facilitate as a presenter and it's really great for me in the future to facilitate a meeting with people yeah thank you so much you're very welcome uh, sharon well i'm very excited by it and i've seen it a few times <laughs> But, uh, but I think it really has a powerful flow. And so it's making me, I was thinking about some groups that I try to encourage to have one of these participate in one of these. So yeah, it's inspired me, even though I've been through it many a time. Very cool. Valerie? Yeah, I, I uh, similar to Sharon now, I've been through this twice and it was the kitchen table climate conversations that first uh, interested me and in like drew me to climate fast uh, I forgot to say that at the beginning um, and I'm just recalling um, a lot of discussion at our sort of strategizing meeting about climate uh, the kitchen table conversations that uh, you know how to get this into the educational community um, so I'm, I've got that kind of rolling around in my head. It's a tough time right now for the educational community, the, the teachers unions and um, even parents. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly, but um, I, I think that, that it would be a great place to use this in parent councils and that kind of thing. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Colleen, uh, for your wonderful uh, um, facilitation tonight. Thanks, Valerie. And I know also Anne, who's a member of Climate Fast, is really working with eco schools. So that's an exciting, an exciting um, opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Lynn? Well, thanks very much, Colleen. I really like going through these materials and the agenda because I think it really gives people just a very minimal structure, but a lot of resources that can allow them to tailor it. And I think that people should know that we're willing to support the, um, the kinds of initiatives people undertake, that we can uh, book the Zoom space and provide technical support. Uh, we like to know that these conversations are happening and, and hosting a conversation can be enough on its own and you may want someone else to help you out. And whatever way people need support, we need to, to move forward with these as probably as we can. And we're also really interested in knowing how did it go when you've done one, we'd love to hear um, how it went. So feedback would be great. And there's a form for that on the website or you can just send us an email. And we do have a, an address kpcc at climatefast.ca. Um, yeah, okay, leave it at that. Thank you. Great, Lynn. Um, Mark? Hi, Colleen. Thanks. Yes, this was my first time participating in, in a KTTC, and it was an interesting experiment because I, I learned a lot about the resources and how to use them, um, learning how to be a facilitator as much as participating in one. So it was an interesting uh, first experience with it. Um, yeah, it was very it was very moving to hear everybody uh, talk about their, at the beginning, about their feelings. Um, the resources are extremely helpful for facilitating uh, scientific conversations. Um, as well as uh, educating those, as well as at the end, what you can do moving forward. So it's a really complete whole experience. Um, yeah, so it, it was very rewarding for me, thanks. And thank you so much, Mark. Not only was this Mark's first KCC, it was also, he was also doing tech for me. So I do appreciate that, that's awesome.
Um, and Rosemary? Rosemary, I think you're on mute. You want to go next? <laughs> oh, sure. I didn't know I was next. So. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm very, very happy. Thank you very much for coming and all the support staff, the tech staff. You did a great job. There was one other little thing I forgot that to mention. It sort of ties back to the eco anxiety stuff, but it is also a resource from the, uh, for the love of creation. If you do sign up, you will get information about a resource they call have called take a sacred pause. And even if you're not like in any particular um, religious tradition, but you sense a sort of eco spirituality of closeness with nature, um, it's a beautiful exercise that can calm you down and you can use for your eco anxiety. So another reason to check out the, that uh, resource. Thanks. It's called Take a Sacred Pause, Rosemary? Yeah, okay, cool. All right, uh, Sarah? Yeah, thank you uh, for this particular training. I've really enjoyed. And um, I know this is not the first time, but now I think uh, between me and Natsuki, we are well equipped to do it. And I believe you're going to spearhead and do the first uh, KTCC uh, training for our group. And I believe we'll call you Colleen and others to just come and you know, support us. And so that uh, after that, we'll be able to do it. At the same time, as I mentioned, we also want to start also doing it with our African partners so that they can also cascade it to their own people. So we'll be looking in that issue, but thank you so much. It was really, really informative. I appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. And that sounds exciting, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark? Colleen, hi. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. So uh, maybe after this, Lynn wants to announce the Eco Fair coming in October. Um, as well as uh, Wendy has mentioned, if my climate club were interested in a KTCC presentation, is there someone I could contact to set something up uh, or something I can tap into? Mm -hmm. Yes, so Wendy, there's two answers to that. One, you can reach out um, to, to me or to the KTCC address too, that will come to Lynn, um, likely uh, Lynn, and we can help you. Uh, we are going to also have on September 16th, a bigger um, facilitation training day with maybe some guest speakers um, to talk about, you know, facilitation techniques and managing eco-anxiety, that type of thing in a little more depth. So we've got that coming up too that you could tap into and you could invite your group to if they were interested. Um, so, so yeah, both ways. We can either help you personally, um, some of our members, or they could attend that bigger event, which will be exciting. Um, Lynn, I'm just gonna let um, Jay and Ray speak and then you can announce the Eco Fair. So Ray, or Jay and then Ray. Jay says she's impressed with what you've done with the original material and have presented so well. Thank you. I'm reading my own compliments. That's, that's really, really nice. Thanks to everyone else who participated as well in those great techs. Yes, thanks so much. And Ray, as a great tech, can you come off? Uh, uh, um, can you speak? Yeah. Hi. I uh, just want to say uh, congratulations to uh, Colleen and um, Mark for, for doing facilitating a great uh, KTC ses session. So, and um, I hope everything goes well. Um, I think it's important as, uh, as, as has been asked for that we can provide some context. So uh, for people that want to put on a session. So um, yeah, let's make sure we, we do that. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So I'll be sending, I'll send an email out to this group um, with like some, um, some, you know, just to follow up and to give you some options and give you some um, of, the, of the resources and the like. And you're welcome to reach out back and ask for anything I might have missed from what, what you need. Um, and then we'll, we can go from there and see about creating um, more of these uh, to support each other or an email chain to support each other that was suggested. That sounds like a great idea too. Um, okay, so that I think that's, uh, that's it. Um, so if anybody has any last minute things to say, so Colleen. Yeah. Oh, you eco fair, right? <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say that there are things upcoming. And uh, one I did mention already was the climate week in September, working with Fridays for Future. We're actually having a planning meeting this Sunday night, Climate Fast is. And if you would like to attend, just email Lynn at climatefast.ca or just put a note in the chat. Uh, or we may just send you the, the, the link to people as a follow-up, but it would be great if you want to get involved. 
Uh, and the other thing I wanted people to know about is the Eco Fair, which is going to be online this year. You may have in the past been to Witchwood Barns for that Eco Fair. This year it's online over four weeks, starting October 15th. And that October 15th date is linked in with a global initiative around counting down, around reducing our carbon emissions. Um, so you'll hear more about that later, but I just wanted to sort of plant that seed. Um, there's many events that happen and whenever you do a KTCC event, it will be important for people to know what, what's the current state of affairs and what kinds of things are happening that they can get involved in. So that's some examples for now. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. So yes, we are having a whole day workshop on September 16th. And so we'll, we'll follow up with some information about that. And yes, thank you everyone so much. Thank you, Mark and Ray. And thank you everyone for attending and participating. Rosemary and Valerie and Lynn and Sarah for participating. And um, everyone's ideas are so motivating. I'm always extra hopeful when I leave a conversation like this. Just It's just so great to hear everyone's ideas. So yeah. Um, Wendy, what does that mean, Evergreen? Oh yes, okay, so we um, have made them updatable so they can be downloaded and changed at any, any given point. And I'm hoping that we'll do updates. Um, I, I'm hoping that we're, we'll do updates like, you know, we're gonna collect feedback and then do updates in maybe, I don't know, four to six months and then keep doing that at, at, ongoing. Because you're right, the links get broken, the information gets dated. So it does have to be spruced up, but it also at any point can be downloaded and you can uh, change something yourself now. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so thanks. Thanks everybody. everybody. Yeah. Maybe we should, um, we should <laughs> do a farewell wave. You've all been recorded. I hope that's okay. If it's not with anyone, you let us know. But uh, anyways, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so all. much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I could take a picture if I could do control uh, print screen. If if we could do a gallery view and everybody, yeah, that looks fabulous. Thank you. Okay, I just did that. Um, Good night, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Thank you. Yes.